Okay, thanks very much. Um, so it's not just my method. Uh, this is joint work with Antti Honkala, Michaelis Tutsias, and Neil Lawrence. So just a quick outline of uh, the talk. I'm going to give a quick motivation uh, of how you can use uh, differential equation style models to uh, find targets of transcription factors. Um, and then I'll talk about a very simple case where we just have a model of regulation by single transcription factor. And it's very simple, but it's uh, quite practical when you have limited uh, gene expression data. I'm going to go into some technicalities about how we use um, Gaussian process inference. So Gaussian processes are popular in Bayesian machine learning and statistics, uh, and they're commonly used in regression, but we're going to use them in a different way. And then I'll give some results, and finally I'll talk about the multi-transcription factor case, which is new work that's under review. So there, there are many different types of data that, that help us learn about uh, transcriptional regulatory networks. Um, for instance, uh, ChIP-seq or ChIP-chip data tell us about uh, where transcription factors bind on the DNA. Um, but nevertheless, they, they don't necessarily tell us which genes are regulated by distant enhancers. So if the binding is far from a gene, then it's not obvious what's going on in terms of regulation. And binding doesn't really tell us about function in terms of uh, quantitative changes in expression. So gene expression data, and particularly time series gene expression data, is still a very useful tool for trying to uncover regulation. And the problem we're trying to address is, given some gene expression data, which is shown here with the red crosses uh, with arrow bars, so this is um, from Affymetrix microarrays, and given a model of regulation, indicated by these arrows here, then can we use the data to determine what are the likely links linking transcription factors and their targets? So the top here, we have uh, inferred protein concentrations for some transcription factors. And I'll, during the talk, I'll explain how we infer those curves. And at the bottom, we have some data. And it looks like, for instance, this transcription factor BAP can't really explain the data very well. Regulation by MEF2 explains it reasonably well. BAP and MEF2 together explain it better, but is it statistically significant that that's better given it's a more complex model? So maybe we have to do some kind of um, Bayesian approach to control for complexity. Um, so first I'm going to talk about models like the ones on the left, which are single transcription factor regulation models. And at the end, I'll talk about joint models of regulation like the one on the right. So we want to fit models like this to score whether these links are supported by the data, basically. So the simplest kind of model I'm going to talk about is the single transcription factor model. And it has two layers. So the first layer is the translation layer where we have some transcription factor mRNA and that's translated into a protein um, and the rate of producing the protein is proportional to F here which is the transcription factor mRNA and then there's some protein decay rate delta and then the other layer is transcription where the regulating protein P, this transcription factor, um, regulates the production of an mRNA, and in this case it's activation. So if you have more transcription factor, you produce the mRNA of the target at a higher rate. And then there's uh, an mRNA decay parameter. And in this case, the little i just represents the fact that um, there are many targets for this transcription factor. Okay. And this kind of simple model has been referred to as a SIM or a single input motif. You have a single transcription factor with a bunch of targets. <clears throat> so 
we want to fit this kind of model to the data genome-wide. And there's a number of problems with that. Um, so we don't know any of the model parameters. So one of the problems with systems biology is that usually we don't have good data for the parameters in particular um, specific in vivo scenarios. So we have to learn those from the data. We finally got a few time points because the experiments are expensive or because in our case we're looking at embryogenesis. It's quite hard to stage the embryos um, very finely in time. And the system's open. There's this driving function here, and we don't know what that's doing. So our approach is to use Gaussian process inference to try and fill in this uh, driving function. And then we're going to compute the probability of the gene expression data given the model parameters. And with that data likelihood, we can score alternative models and decide whether there's support for this regulation going on for a particular target. So I'm going to give a quick overview of what a Gaussian process is. Um, there's going to be a little bit of math. If that makes you uncomfortable, then it will go away quite soon and it will just be pictures. Okay. So... Um, so a Gaussian process is analogous to Gaussian distribution. And a Gaussian distribution is characterized by a mean and a variance. A Gaussian process is characterized by a mean function and a covariance function. And the mean function is the average of the function over many draws. So you can, this is a, um, a random process, but rather than generating a random number like your uh, random number generator, we're generating random functions. And mu here, this function of time, is a mean of those functions over time. And this k here is the covariance, which tells you how correlated points are at two different times. And generally in these functions, the closer you get, the more correlated you are, the further away you are, the less correlated. But this function tells you about somehow the smoothness or roughness of these functions that were drawn from this distribution. And it's popular in machine learning now because it has some useful properties that allow you to do Bayesian inference over these types of functions given data. So Gaussian process regression and classification are now standard tools in machine learning. So to give you a flavor of how you get from a Gaussian distribution to a Gaussian function, um, what I'm showing here are points drawn from a 25-dimensional Gaussian distribution, but they are ordered in a particular way so that nearby points are highly correlated with one another. And what highly correlated means is that if you know the value of a point, say this uh, fifth point here, then it's a pretty good guess that the points close to it will be close to that function value. So that means knowing this tells you a lot about this at n equals 6. And those two points are highly correlated. But knowing about 5 doesn't tell you much about 23 over here. Okay? And those points are far away. And if you draw from this distribution, then they're almost independent of one another. So the further away you go, the more correlated you are. And the covariance matrix captures this. So Along the diagonal here, we have high values, which says that um, points with this value and this value close together are highly correlated. Points that are far away are uncorrelated. So if you plot a Gaussian uh, data from a Gaussian distribution like this, it looks a bit like a function. So you can imagine drawing a line through those points and that's your function. And a Gaussian process is just the limit where we go from 25 up to infinity. But when we implement this in a computer, we do it for a finite set of points. So really, we're dealing with Gaussian distributions. And the covariance matrix that I showed you 
can be derived from different functional forms. So what I actually used there was a squared exponential, which uh, I'm showing here. And this function here has a parameter L. And L tells me the length scale of this function, which is basically how wiggly it is. So on the left is an example where L is relatively large, and on the right, L is small. Um, and in the cases I'm going to look at, it's not length, it's actually time, because we're going to be looking at time series data. Okay, so these are parameterized by these, what we call hyperparameters. So let's go back to the single transcription factor um, model of activation. So we have these two layers, translation and transcription. Now, um, a bit of calculus tells you what the solution to these differential equations is. So you can write those down in closed form. You don't really, it doesn't really matter what the form is, but what you can see is that this P here and this F are linearly related. Okay? So integrals are just like sums in maths. So if you see an integral, you can think of it as a sum, and P is a sum over lots of different values of F. M is a sum over different values of P, and that means that P and M are both linear functions of F. And if you have a Gaussian distribution, if you add up a bunch of Gaussian variables, you get another Gaussian distribution. And it's the same with Gaussian processes. So if I add up a bunch of Gaussian processes, I get another Gaussian process. This is the math slide. Okay. Um, so if... I assume that my input mRNA of the transcription factor is drawn from a Gaussian process, then it turns out that the target mRNA after the translation and the transcription stage is also drawn from a Gaussian process, and I can work out what the mean and the covariance function of that Gaussian process is. And it's a function that depends on the parameters of the regulation model, the decays and so on. Then I have some gene expression data, uh, which is just noise-corrupted mRNA values from a microarray. And I can write down in closed form the likelihood of the data under this model. And if you have the likelihood, that means you can fit the parameters of the model using maximum likelihood. So this makes this approach very practical because it has a very neat and simple form for the likelihood. And the likelihood is basically a kind of weighted least squares where uh, closer together points according to this covariance matrix are um, up-weighted. So now it's on to pictures, um, which might be better. Um, so we can fit this in two different ways, this single TF model. Um, and I'm going to show examples of each way. So this is uh, gene expression data from Eileen Furlong's lab. Uh, sorry, no, it's not. It's uh, from uh, Tom and Chet's lab, sorry. Um, and we, um, we fit the model to this gene expression data. Um, and so the red crosses are the uh, microarray data. At the top here, we have the values for the twist transcription factor mRNA. And at the bottom, we have potential targets of that mRNA. We don't know whether they're targets or not. We're fitting the model to see if they potentially are. And in this way of using the model, what we've done is we've just fitted a completely different independent model to each of these targets. And what you can see is that if you have different decay parameters for the protein and for the target mRNA, you can get quite a rich variety of behaviors for the target mRNA, all of which could be explained by the same driving twist transcription factor mRNA. Now, I'm assuming here that there's the rate limiting step here is transcription of the transcription factor. Um, I'm not going to talk about phosphorylation, but I'm going to mention that in my conclusions. Okay, so we're just assuming that the transcription factor is transcribed, translated, and then functions. And any phosphorylation that's going on isn't a rate-limiting step. 
Okay, so this is fine, but it doesn't quite capture our biological knowledge that it's the same transcription factor in each case. And the inferred um, protein profile here is inconsistent for these different targets. So a different approach is to jointly model all the targets with the same model. So now we have the input twist mRNA, and that's uh, translated into a protein. The protein uh, has a reasonably long half-life, and therefore it's kind of uh, decaying a bit slower than the input mRNA. And now with this model, we see that, well, the two on the right can still be fit quite well, but the one on the left uh, can't be fit with the same model. So this is a more conservative way of using the model where we're ensuring that all the targets are consistent with the same protein profile. Now, biologically, this makes more sense. But empirically, the previous one actually scores better. Um, and that may be because um, in this use of the model, you need a training set of genes which are known targets. And it's rather sensitive, perhaps, to how you choose those training genes. Um, because you need a set of genes which you know that fit the, uh, the twist regulation model. And then you add in genome-wide a new gene and see if it fits the same model. So it's rather dependent on the uh, training set being good. For a different transcription factor, also um, involved in this uh, Drosophila development process, um, MEF2, we see that, well, most of the targets are a bit boring. They do roughly the same thing. And they correlate quite highly with the transcription factor mRNA. And we'll see, actually, that in this case, the model doesn't give us a big benefit because the targets um, are all rather similar and quite highly correlated with the input. So we fitted this uh, model to this gene expression data, this time course, and we used um, chip data, and the chip data was from the Furlong lab, so that's why I got the data sets confused. So um, we have some chip-chip data for the twist and MEF2 transcription factors. And we want to use the chip data to validate our targets. Now, it doesn't really give us a gold standard because um, there could be regulation which is through enhancers that aren't local to the gene. But we would expect that genes regulated by these transcription factors are more likely to have binding nearby in the chip data. So what we did was we looked for chip binding within 2 kb of the gene. And this is Drosophila, so it's a fairly compact uh, genome. So 2 kb seemed reasonable. And I'll show that the results are fairly robust to that particular cho choice in a moment. We looked at the single target models and the multiple target models. Um, so I showed examples of those two types. And we compared to knockouts, and we compared to just correlation with the transcription factor mRNA. And for MEF2, the correlation worked pretty well. So the model wasn't really that useful. But for twist, the model gave us a big win. And that's really because the targets are very diverse in their expression and don't correlate at all well with the twist mRNA profile. And we also validated against knockouts, and that's a similar kind of picture. We also looked at a focus set where we only consider genes expressed in the same place in the embryo, and we got better enrichment in that case. And if we want to change the 2KB restriction, we looked at um, distances where we included binding further and further away, and the results were rather insensitive to that. Uh, you just get more false positives as well as uh, positives if you do that. <clears throat> okay, so technically there's an advantage to this approach because we can integrate out this input function. We don't have to represent it parametrically, so the system ends up having very few parameters, and you can fit it to very uh, short time course. Um, it's a continuous time model, so uh, the time points can be uh, unevenly spaced, 
Um, disadvantages is Gaussian processes aren't guaranteed positive and we're representing concentrations which are guaranteed positive. To fix that, we have to make our models nonlinear. Basically, we have to exponentiate these Gaussians. Uh, doing that means uh, things aren't analytically tractable anymore and we have to use uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo techniques. So finally, I just want to quickly talk about some uh, more recent work. Uh, so what I talked about was, was published work. The current, this work is uh, under review or under revision. So we want to extend this to multiple transcription factors, nonlinear regulation models, um, and to do that, we have to use uh, um, more heavy-duty Bayesian inference machinery. So what we do is we split up the task into a training stage and a scanning stage. In the training stage, we take a well-characterized subnetwork, maybe 20, 30, or 100 genes for which we have pretty good evidence of the regulatory network. It doesn't have to be perfect, but quite good evidence. And then we scan genome-wide to see which of the possible regulation patterns are supported by the data. And we score all of these different models against the data. So if we look at some artificial data in this case, um, where we know what the transcription factor protein profiles are, and then we look at how we infer those at the training stage, then what we see is that if there are transcription factors which have rather similar profiles, like the red and blue case here, then the inference can be confused by them, and you get quite large error bars. If you have data from another condition where these transcription factors are quite well separated, then the inferred concentrations uh, look much nicer, and you can clearly separate them. So inferring the targets of multiple transcription factors is made difficult if some of the transcription factors are indistinguishable, have very similar profiles. And you can see that if you look at ROC plots of performance. Okay? So um, the green transcription factor is highly separated, highly distinctive in its behavior. And even with one time series, we can do well on that. The red and blue are rather similar and in the case where we only have one condition, the top one here, then the ROC is rather poor, shown by the red line. If we have two conditions, we do much better. Okay, so having diversity in the conditions where the transcription factors are different helps us. And if we look at the same Drosophila time course data as before, we see that luckily in this case, uh, the transcription factors are reasonably distinctive. So this is fitting the model to real data and inferring the transcription factor profiles for three replications of the time course. Okay? And the replications are highly consistent and the transcription factors are peaking at quite different places. So hopefully we can do some inference on this case. And scoring against the chip-chip data... Um, MAP 32 is basically choosing the best of the 32 alternative regulation models for five transcription factors. So we fitted this to, to find the targets of five transcription factors. And we're doing a lot better than random, a lot better than a baseline, which is based on maximum likelihood, and also much better than sparse regression based on the transcription factor mRNA profiles, which really doesn't do very well at all. And uh, we also, as well as predicting individual links in the regulatory network, we can try and do the harder thing of trying to predict pairs of regulating TFs. So for a gene, is there evidence of a pair working together in order to regulate it? And with the multiple transcription factor model, we can uh, find good enrichment for that. And we don't really know how good these results are because the, the chip data can't really be considered a gold, gold standard, but um, enrichment is a good thing. Okay, so um, Gaussian processes are a useful way to close uh, open differential equation models of regulation. 
Um, the model probability can be used to score different models and thereby find likely regulatory interactions. Um, we can easily integrate this with other information about the network. I was only using gene expression time course, but we could use chip data to make these predictions better. Um, and this is all implemented in the Tigra Bioconductor package, which is available now. And these are the papers. Thanks.